Hello, welcome back. The uh, finishing Alice in Wonderland. There we go. I'm still getting used to this opposite direction thing. And Maestro has decided to join us. Well, never mind. I'm leaving. Uh, and this background is going to be changing. It's a bit too busy and bright. So I'm going to get something a bit more, you know, some blue or purple. Uh, later tonight and by the next stream on Tuesday, it will be a different color. Anyways, let us go ahead and Alice in Wonderland. Chapter 11, Humpty Dumpty. However, the egg only got larger and larger and more and more human. When she had a few yards of it, she saw that it uh, had eyes and a nose and mouth. And close to it, she saw clearly that it was Humpty Dumpty himself. It counts, she said to herself. I'm as certain of it as if his name were written all over his face. It might have been written a hundred times easily on that enormous face. Humpty Dumpty with his legs crossed like a Turk on the top of a high wall, such a narrow one, wondered how he could keep his balance. And as his eyes were steadily fixed in the young, he didn't take the least notice of her. She thought he must be a stuffed figure after all. How exactly like an egg he is, she said aloud, standing with her hands, for she was every moment expecting him to fall. It's very Humpty Dumpty said after a long silence, looking away from Alice as he spoke, to be called an airy. I said you looked like an egg, sir, Alice gently explained. And are very pretty, you know, she added, hoping to turn her remark into a sort of compliment. Oh, said Humpty Dumpty, looking away from her, as usual. Have no more sense than a baby. Alice didn't know what to say to this. It wasn't at all like conversation, she thought, as he knew her. In fact, this last mark, remark was evidently addressed to a tree, repeated softly to herself. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty. Wall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty in his place again. That last line is very much too long for the poetry, she added almost out loud, forgetting that her. Don't stand chattering to yourself like that, Humpty Dumpty said, looking at her. But tell me your name and your business. My name is Alice, but it's a stupid enough, Humpty Dumpty interrupted impatiently. What does it mean? Must a name mean? Alice asked doubtfully. Of course it must, Humpty Dumpty said with a short laugh. Name means the shape I am, and a good handsome shape it is too. Of course, you might be any shape almost. Why do you sit out here all alone? said Alec in an argument. Why, because there's nobody with me, cried Humpty Dumpty. Do you know the answer to that? Ask another. Don't you think you'd be safer down on the ground? Uh, not with any idea of making another riddle, but simply in her good nature and anxiety for the... That wall is so very narrow. Don't tremendously ask, Humpty Dumpty growled out. Of course I don't think so. Why, if I have... Uh, why, if ever I love, which there's no chance of, but if I did, here he pursed his lips and grand that Alice could hardly keep laugh, help laughing. If, uh, he went on, the king has promised me uh, you may turn pale if you like. You were to say that, did you? The king has promised me with his very own mouth to, to send all his horses and all his men, Alice interrupted rather unwisely. Claire, that's too bad, Humpty Dumpty cried, breaking into sudden passion. You said behind trees and down chimneys, or you couldn't have known it. I haven't, he said very gently. It's in a book. Ah, oh, well, there they made things in a book, Humpty Dumpty said in a calmer tone. That's what you call England, that is. Now, take a good look at me. I'm one that has spoken to a am. Mayhap you'll never see such another. And to show you I'm not proud, shake hands with me. And he grinned almost from ear to ear as he leaned forward and, as possible, fell off the wall in doing so, and offered Alice his hand. She watched him a little anxiously as she took it. If he smelled much more, the ends of his mouth behind, she thought, and then I don't know what would happen to his head. I'm afraid it would come. Yes, all his horses and all his men, Humpty Dumpty went on. They'd pick me if they would. However, this conversation is going on a little too fast. Let's go back but one. I'm afraid I can't quite remember it, Alice said very politely. In that case, 
we start fresh, said Humpty Dumpty. And it's my turn to choose a subject. He talks about it just as if it was a game, thought Alice. So here's a question for did you say you were? Alice made a short calculation and said, six months. Wrong, Humpty Dumpty exclaimed triumphantly. You never said a word. I thought you meant how old are you? Alice explained, if I'd meant it, I'd have said it, said Humpty Dumpty. Alice didn't want to begin another argument, so she said, seven years and six months, Humpty Dumpty repeated thoughtfully. I know age now. If you'd ask my advice, I'd have said leave off at seven, but it's I never asked advice about growing, Alice said indignantly. Too proud, fired. Alice felt even more indignant at this suggestion. I mean, she said, that no one can't help growing older. <clears throat> one can't, perhaps, but two can. With proper assistance, you might have left off at seven. What a beautiful belt you've got on, Alice suddenly remarked. They had had quite enough of the subject, and if they really were to take turns in choosing subjects, it was her turn now. I directed herself on second thoughts. A beautiful cravat, I should have said. No, a belt. I beg your pardon, she asked in dismay, for Humpty Dumpty looked thoroughly offended, and she hadn't chosen that subject. If only I knew, she thought to herself, which was neck and which was evidently Humpty Dumpty was very angry, but he said nothing for a minute or two. He did speak again. It was in a deep growl. It is a most provoking, he said at last, when a person doesn't know a cravat from a belt. I know it's very me, Alice said, in so humble a tone that Humpty Dumpty relented. It, child, and a beautiful one, as you say. It's a present from the White King there now. Is it really? said Alice, quite pleased to find that she had chosen a good son. They gave it to me, Humpty Dumpty continued thoughtfully as he crossed one knee over the other, and his hands round it. They gave it to me for an unbirthday present, beg your pardon, Alice said with a puzzled air. I am not offended, said I mean, what is an unbirthday present? A present given birthday, of course. Alice considered a little. I like birthday presents best. You don't know what you're talking about, cried Humpty Dumpty. How many days are there in a year? Just end sixty-five, said Alice. And how many birthdays have you? One. Take one from three hundred and sixty-five. What remains? Three hundred and sixty-four. Humpty Dumpty looked doubtful. I'd rather see that done on paper, he said smiling as she took out her memorandum book and worked the sum for him. Uh, where are we? There it is. Humpty Dumpty took the book at it carefully. That seems to be done right, he began. You're holding it upside down. To be sure I was, Humpty Dumpty said gaily as, he as she turned. I thought it looked a little queer, as I was saying, that seems to be done right. The wife looked over thoroughly just now, and that shows that there are 364 might get on birthday presents. Certainly, said Alice, and only birthday presents you know. There's glory for you. I don't know what you mean by glory. Humpty Dumpty smiled contemptuously. Of course you don't, till I tell you. And there's a nice knockdown argument for you. But glory doesn't mean an argument, Alice objected. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean. Neither more. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master. That's all. Alice was too much puzzled to say anything, so after a minute, Humpty Dumpty began They've a temper, some of them, particularly verbs. They're the proudest. You can do anything with, but not verbs. However, I can manage them. Impertin uh, impenetrability, that's a. Would you tell me, please, said Alice, what that means? No, reasonable child, said Humpty Dumpty, looking very much pleased. I meant penetrability, that they've had enough of that subject, and it would be just mention what you mean to do next, as I suppose you don't mean to stop here all the That's a great deal to make one word mean, Alice said in a thoughtful tone. But I make a word to do a lot of work like that, said Humpty Dumpty. I always... Oh, said Alice. She was 
it's too much puzzle to make any of. Uh, you see, um, uh, ah, you see him come round me. The sight, Humpty Dumpty went on, waggling his head gravely from side to side. Wages, you know. Alice did not venture to ask what he paid them with. The I can't tell you. You seem very clever at explaining words, sir. Would you kindly tell me the meaning of the poem called Jabberwocky? Let's hear it, Dumpty. I can explain all the poems that ever were invented, and a good one invented yet. This sounded very hopeful, so Alice repeated the first. "'Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and nimble in the wind. All mimsy were the bora groves, and the mome raths outgrave. That's an Humpty Dumpty interrupted. There are plenty of hard words there. Brillig means for the afternoon, the time when you begin boiling things, uh, broiling things for dinner. That'll do very well, said Alice. And slithy, well, slithy means light, and slimy is the same as active. That life is the same as, it's like a port, uh, portmanteau. There are two meanings in one word. I see it now, Alice remarked thoughtfully. What are to well, toves are something like badgers. They're something like lizards and they're corkscrews. They must be very curious looking creatures, said Humpty Dumpty. Also, they make their nests under sundials. Also, these. And what's to gyre and gimbal? To gyre is to go round like a gyroscope. To gimbal is to make holes like a gimlet. Wave is the grass plot round a sundial, I suppose. I was surprised at her own ingenuity. Of course it is. It's called wave, you know, because a way before it, and a long way behind it. And a long way beyond it, Alice added, exactly so. And then Mimsy is flimsy and miss another portmanteau for you. And a, a borrow grove, shabby looking bird with its feathers sticking out all round something like a live and then mom rats said alice i'm afraid i'd give up trouble well a wrath is a sort of a green pig but mom i'm not certain about it's so a short for from home meaning that they love and what does outgrade mean well out outgrading is something between bellowing and whistling, a sneeze in the middle. However, you'll hear it done, maybe, down in the wood yonder, and heard it, you'll be quite content. Who's been repeating all that to you? I read it in a book, said Alice, but I had some poetry repeated to me. Uh, easier than that by Tweedledee, I think it was. Poetry, you, you know, said Humpty Dumpty, stretching out one of his great hands, and repeat poetry as well as other folk, if it comes to that. Oh, it needn't, hastily said, hoping to keep him from beginning. The piece I'm going to repeat, without noticing her remark, was written entirely for your amusement. Alice felt that in that case, she really ought to listen to it. So she sat down and said, rather sadly, in winter, when the fields are white, I sing this delight. Only I don't sing it, he added in an explanation. I see you don't. If you can see whether I'm singing or not, you've sharper eyes than most. Humpty Dumpty remarked. Alice was silent. In spring, when woods are getting green, I can tell you what I mean. Thank you very much, said Alice. In summer, when the days are long, you'll understand the song. In autumn, when the leaves are brown, take pen and ink. And I will if I can remember it so long, said Alice. You needn't go on making remarks like that. They're not sensible, and they put me out. I sent a message to the fish. This is what I wish. The little fishes of the sea, they sent an answer back to me. His answer was, we cannot do it, sir, because I'm afraid I don't quite understand. It gets easier further on, Humpty Dumpty replied. I sent to them again to say, we'll be better to obey. The fishes answer with a grin, why, what a time. I told them once, I told them twice. They would not listen to advice. I had a, uh, a kettle large and new, fit for the deed I had to do. My heart went thump, I filled the kettle at the pump. Then the 
when some man came to me, the little fishes are in bed. I said to him, I said it plain, then you must again. I said it very loud and clear. I went and shouted in his ear. And he raised his voice almost to a scream as he repeated this verse. And Alice thought with a shudder, I didn't messenger for anything. But he was very stiff and proud. He shouted so loud. And he was very proud and stiff. And he said, I go and wait. I took a corkscrew from the shelf. I went to wake them up myself. And was locked. I pulled and pushed and kicked and knocked. And then I found the door was shut. I tried to, but there was a long pause. Is that all? Alice timidly asked. All said Humpty Dumpty goodbye. This was rather sudden, Alice thought. But after a strong hint that she ought to be going, she felt that it would hardly be civil to stay, and held out her hand. Goodbye till we meet again, she said as cheerfully as she could. With you again if we did meet, Humpty Dumpty replied in discontented tone, one of his fingers to shake. So you're exactly like other people. You're so exactly like other people. The face is what goes by, generally, Alice remarked in a thoughtful tone. That's what I know, said Humpty Dumpty. Your face is the same as everybody has. Eyes, so may, marking their places in the air. Nose in the middle, mouth under. It's always the same. You had the two eyes on the same side of the nose, for instance, or the mouth at the top. Um, help. It wouldn't look nice, Alice objected. But Humpty Dumpty only said, Wait till you've tried. Alice waited a minute to see him again. But as he never opened his eyes or took any further notice of her, she said, Mar, and getting no answer to this, she quietly walked away. But she couldn't help as she went. Of all the unsatisfactory, she repeated this aloud, a comfort to have such a long word to say, of all the unsatisfactory ever met. She never finished the sentence, for at this moment a heavy crash from end to end. Chapter 12. The Lion and the Unicorn. The next moment, soldiers came running through the woods. A first in twos and threes, they together. And at last, in such crowds, that they seemed to fill the whole floor. Alice got behind a tree for fear of being run over, and watched them go by. In all her life, she had never seen soldiers so uncertain on their feet. They were always seeing her other, and whenever one went down, several more always fell over him so soon covered with little heaps of men. Then came the horses. These managed rather better than the foot soldiers, but even they stumbled now and then, and it seemed to cool that whenever a horse stumbled, the rider fell off instantly. The confusion got a moment, and Alice was very glad to get out of the wood into an open place. The white king, seated in the, on the ground, busily writing in his memorandum book. I've sent them all, the king cried in a tone of delight on seeing Alice. Did you happen to meet it as you came through the wood? Yes, I did, said Alice. Several thousand, I Four thousand two hundred and seven. That's the exact number, the king said. I couldn't send all the horses, you know, because two of them are wanted in the game. I haven't sent the two messengers either. They're both gone to the town. Just just along the road, and tell me if you can see either of them. I see nobody on the road, said Alice. I had such eyes, said the king, uh, the king marked in a stone. I be able to see nobody, and at that distance, to quiet as much as the real people by this light. All this was lost on Alice, who was still looking in the road, shading her eyes with one hand. I see somebody now, she exclaimed. But he is coming very slowly, and what curious attitudes he goes into. For the messing up and down and wriggling like an eel as he came along with his great hands spread out like on each side. Not at all, said the king. He is an Anglo-Saxon, and those are Anglo-Saxon -Anglo attitudes. He only does them when he is happy. Is Haiga. He pronounced it so as to rhyme it with hey. Hey. I love my an H. Alice couldn't help beginning because he is happy. I hate him when uh, with an H because he is hideous. I fed with 
with ham sandwiches and hay. His name is and he lives. He lives on the hill, the king remarked simply, without the least idea of joining in the game, which Alice was still listening for the name of the town, beginning with eight. The other messengers, a messenger is called Hatta. I must have two, you know, one to come and one to go. I beg your pardon, said Alice. Respectable to beg, said the king. I only meant that I didn't understand, said Alice. I want to come and one to go. Don't I tell you, the king patiently, I must have two to fetch and carry, one to fetch and one to carry. The moment the messenger arrived, he was far too much out of breath to say a word, and could only wave his the most fearful faces at the poor king. This young lady loves you with an eight, said, introducing Alice in a hope of turning off the messenger's attention from him. But it was no use. The Anglo-Saxon attitudes only got more extraordinary every moment. Eyes rolled wildly from side to side. You will learn me, said the king. I should give me a ham sandwich. On which the messenger, to Alice's great amusement, opened a bag that had neck and handed a sandwich to the king, who devoured it greedily. And said the king, there's nothing but hay left now, the messenger said, peeping into the bag. Then, the king murmured in a faint whisper. Alice was glad to see a good deal. There's nothing like eating hay when you're faint, he remarked to her as he munched. I should think throwing cold water over you would be better, Alice suggested, or some sal volatile. I didn't say there was nothing better, the king replied. I said there was nothing like it, which Alice denied. Who did you pass on the road? The king went on holding out his hand to the messenger. Hey, nobody, said the messenger. Quite right, said the king. This young lady, too. So, of course, nobody walks slower than you. I do my best, the messenger said in a sullen tone. I am sure nobody walks much faster than I. He can't do that, said the king, or else we'd have been heated. However, now you've got your breath, you may tell us what's happened in the town. Oh, said the messenger, putting his hands to his mouth in the shape of a trumpet and stooping so as to King's ear. Alice was sorry for this, as she wanted to hear the news too. However, instantly shouted at the top of his voice, They're at it again! That a whisper? cried the poor king, jumping up and shaking himself. If you do such a buttered... It went through and through my head like an earthquake. It would have to be an earthquake, thought Alice. Who are at it again, she ventured to ask. Why the lion and the horse, said the king, fighting for the crown? Yes, to be sure. Said, and the best of the joke is that it's my crown all the while. And they trotted off, Alice repeating to herself as she ran the words of the old song. The unicorn were fighting for the crown. The lion beat the unicorn all around the town. Some white bread, some gave them brown, some gave them plum cake, and drummed them out of town. The one that wins get the crown, she asked, as well as run, was putting her quite out of breath. Dear me, no, said the king. What an idea. Be good enough, Alice panted out after running a little further. Just stop a minute. One's breath again. I'm good enough, the king said. Only I'm not strong goes by some fearfully so fearfully quick. We might as well try to stop snatch. Alice had no sight of a great crowd in the middle of which the lion and unicorn they were in such a cloud of dust that at first Alice could not make out which was which she soon managed to distinguish the unicorn by his horn. They placed themselves clatter. The other messenger was standing watching the fight, with a cup of tea in one hand and a piece in the other. He's only just out of prison, and he hasn't finished his tea when he was sent in. Hey, uh, hey, uh, whispered to Alice, and they only give them oysters. You see, he's very hungry and thirsty. How are you, dear child? He went on, patting, uh, putting his arm around Hatta's neck. Hatta looked round and nodded, and went on with his... You were happy in prison, dear child, said Hea. Hatta once more... And this time, a tear or two trickled down his cheek, but not say. Speak, can't you? Hea cried impatiently, but Hatta only munched or tea. Speak, won't you? cried the ching king. How are they getting on with the... Hatta made a desperate effort and swallowed a large piece of bread and butter. 
very well, he said in a choking voice. Each of them has been down about 87 times, and I suppose they'll be, that they, they'll bring, uh, wow. Suppose they'll soon bring the bread and, uh, the white bread and the brown, Alice ventured. It's waiting for him now, said Hatta. This is a bit of it I'm eating. I was in the fight just then, and the lion and the unicorn sat down panting while the king called out, Tell for refreshments. Taya and Hatta went to work at once carrying it in brown bread. Alice took a piece to taste, but it was very dry. Don't fight any more today, the king said to Hatta. Go and order the drum to begin, ending away like a grasshopper. For a minute or two, Alice stood silent, watching him, frightened up. Look, look, she cried, pointing eagerly. There's the white queen running away. She came flying out of the wood over yonder. How fast those queens can! run. There's some enemy after her, no doubt, the king said without even looking round. But aren't you going to run and help her? Alice asked, very much surprised at his take so quietly. No use, no use, said the king. She runs so fearfully quick. I catch a bandersnatch, but I'll make a memorandum about her if you like. She's a dear good queen, softly to himself as he opened his memorandum book. Do you spell creature L-E? At this moment, the unicorn sauntered by them with in his pockets. I had the best of it this time, he said to the king just as he paused. Uh, as he passed. A little, a little, the king replied. Right, you shouldn't have run him through with your horn, you know. I didn't hurt him, he said carelessly, and he was going on when his eye happened to fall upon Alice. He didn't leave and stood for some time looking at her with an air of deepest disgust. What is this? he said at last. This is a child, replied eagerly, coming in front of Alice to introduce her and spreading out both his hands toward the Saxon attitude. We only found it today. It's as large as life and twice as now. I always thought they were fabulous monsters, said the unicorn. He said a he can talk, said Haya solemnly. The unicorn looked dress and said, Talk, child. Alice could not help her lips curling up into a hand. Do you know, I always thought unicorns were fabulous monsters, too. I never saw one alive. Well, now that we have seen each other, said the unicorn, if you'll believe in me, I'll believe in a bargain. Yes, if you like, said Alice. Come, fetch out the plum cake, old man, Don, turning from, from her to the king. None of your brown bread for me. Sir, the king muttered and beckoned to Haya. Open the bag, he whispered. Quick, not that one. That's full. Haya made a large cake, uh, took a large cake out of the bag and gave it to Alice. He got out a dish and carving knife. How they all came out of it. Yes, it was just like a conjuring trick, she thought. The lion had joined them while it was, he looked very tired and sleepy and his eyes were half shut. What's this, he said, way at Alice, and speaking in a deep, hollow tone that sounded like a tolling of a great bell. Uh, what is it now? The unicorn cried eagerly. You'll never guess. I the lion looked at, eager at Alice wearily. Are you animal, vegetable, or mineral, he said, yawning at every other word. Fabulous monster, the unicorn cried out before Alice could reply. Then have a big monster, the lion said, lying down and putting his chin on his paws. And sit down with the king and the unicorn. Fair play with the cake, you know. The king was evidently very unwilling to sit down between the two great creatures, but there was no other place for him. What a fight we might have for the crown now, the unicorn said, looking slum, which the poor king was merely shaking off his head. He was trembling. I could win easily, said the lion. I'm not so sure of that, said the unicorn. You show all around the town, you chicken. The lion replied angrily, half giving up as he spoke. Here the king interrupted to prevent the quarrel going on. He was very nervous, and his voice quivered. All around the town, he said, it's a good way long it's a good long way go by the old bridge or the marketplace. You get the best view by the old bridge. I'm sure I don't and growled out as he lay down again. There was too much dust to see anything. So was cutting up that cake. Alice had seated herself on the bank of a little brook on her knees and was sawing away diligently with the knife. It's very provoking, she said to the lion. She was 
getting quite used to being called the monster. I've cut them already, but they always join on again. You don't know how to manage looking glass cakes. Hand it round first and cut it afterwards. This sounded nonsense, but Ally obediently got up and carried the dish round and the cake delivered itself into the she did so. Now cut it out, said the lion as he returned to her place, uh, her place with the empty dish. I say, this is fair, cried the sat with a knife on her in her hand, very much puzzled how to begin. The lion twice as much as me. She's kept none for herself anyhow, said the lion plum cake monster. But Alice could answer uh, Alice but before Alice could answer him, the drums began. Where the no couldn't make out, the air seemed full of it, and it rang through and through her head quite deafened. She started to her feet and sprang across the little brook in town and had just time to see the lion and the unicorn rise to their feet with angry looks in their feast before she dropped to her knees and put her hands over her ear, trying to shut out the dreadful uproar. If that doesn't drum them out of town, she thought he never will. Chapter oh, 8. I think I was reading the wrong. Chapter 8. It's my own invention. After a while, the noise gradually to die away till all was dead silence, and Alice lifted up her head, and there was no one to be seen, and her first thought was that she must have been dreaming about corn and those queer Anglo-Saxon messengers. However, there was a great dish still feet on which she had tried to cut the plum cake, so it wasn't dreaming after all herself, unless... Unless we're all part of the same dream. I do hope it, it's my dream and not the Red King's. I don't like belonging to another person. She went on in a rather complaining tone. I have a great mind to go and wake happens. And at this moment, her thoughts were interrupted by a loud shouting of a check. And the knight, dressed in crimson armor, came galloping down upon brandishing a great club. Just as he reached her, the horse stopped suddenly. Your king, the knight cried, as he tumbled off his horse. Startled as she was, more frightened for him than for herself at the moment, and watched him with some anxiety mounted again. As soon as he was comfortably in the saddle, he began once more. But here another voice broke in, Ahoy! Ahoy! Check! And Alice looked around in some surprise. This time it was the white knight. He drew up, drew up, and Alice had tumbled off his horse just as the red knight had done. Then he got on again, and the two knights at each other for some time without speaking. Alice looked from one to the other in some. She's my prisoner, you know," the knight, uh, the red knight said at last. Then I came and rescued her," the white knight replied. "Well, we mustn't," said the red knight as he took up his helmet, which hung from the saddle and was something of a shape, and he put it on. You will observe the rules of battle, of course, putting on his helmet, too. I always do, said the Red Knight, and they began banging with such fury that Alice got behind a tree to be out of the way of the blood. I wonder now what the rules of battle are, she said to herself, as she watched the fight, and timidly leave her hiding hole. One rule seems to be that if one knight hits the other, he knocks, and if he misses, he tumbles off himself. And another rule seems to be that clubs with their arms as if they were Punch and Judy. What a noise they make when they tumble. The whole set of fire irons falling into the fender. And how quiet they let them get on and off them just as if they were tables. Another what uh, that Alice had not noticed seemed to be that they had they always fell on the, and the battle ended with their both falling off in this way, side by side. And they, they shook hands, and then the red knight mounted and galloped off. It was a glorious victory, said the white knight, as he came up panting. I don't know, Alice said doubt. I don't want to be anybody's prisoner. I want to be a queen. So you will have you will when you've crossed the next brook, said the white knight. I'll see you safe to the end of the wood. I must go back, you know. That's the end of my move. Thank you, Miss. May I help you off with your helmet? It was evidently more than he could manage by himself. He managed to shake it out of it, uh, shake him out of it at least. 
one can breathe more easily, said the knight, putting back his shaggy hair with both hands, and her face and large, mild eyes to Alice. She thought she had never strange-looking soldier in all her life. He was dressed in tin armor, which seemed very badly, and he had a queer-shaped little deal box fastened to his upside down and with the lid hanging open. Alice looked at it with great curiosity. I see you're admiring my little box, the knight said in a friendly tone. It's my own to keep clothes and sandwiches in. You see, I carry it upside down so that the but the things can get out, Alice gently remarked. Do you know the lid's open? Know it, said the knight, a shade of vexation passing over his face. Then all have fallen out, and the box is no use without them. He unfastened it as he spoke, and was just in the bushes when a sudden thought seemed to strike him, and he hung it carefully on a tree. I did that, he said to Alice. Alice shook her head. In hopes some bees may make. Then I should get the honey. But you've got a beehive or something fastened to the saddle, said Alice. Yes, it's a very good beehive, the knight said, in a down, one of the best kind, but not a single bee has come near it yet. And the other thing, suppose the mice keep the bees out, or the bees keep the mice out. I don't know which. Wondering what the mouse trap was for, said Alice. It isn't very likely there would mice on the horse's back. Not very likely, perhaps, said the knight. But do come. I don't choose to have them running all about. You see, he went on, it's as well to be provided for everything. That's the reason the horse has anklets around his feet. But what are they there? Uh, but were Alice asked in a tone of great curiosity. To guard against the bites of sharks, said the knight replied. It's an invention of my own. And now help me on. To the end of the wood. What's that dish for? It's meant for plum cake, said Alice. Yes, the knight said. Uh, it'll come in handy if we find any plum cake. Help me to get a bag. Uh, help me to get it in this bag. This took a lunch, though Alice held the bag open very carefully, because the knight was so very off dish. The first two or three minutes that he fell in himself instead. It's rather a tight fit, you see, he said, as they got it in at last. There are so many candlesticks in the bag, and he hung it in the saddle, already loaded with bunches of carrots and fire iron and many other things. I hope you've got your hair well fastened on, he continued as they set off. Away, Alice said, smiling. That's hardly enough, he said anxiously. You see the wind is strong here. It's as strong as soup. Have you invented a for keeping the hair from being blown off, Alice inquired. Not yet, uh, said the knight, but I've got a plan for keeping it from falling off. I hear it very much. First you take an upright stick, said the knight. Then you make your hair it like a tree, a fruit tree. Now the reason hair falls off is be down. Things never fall upward, you know. It's a plan of my own invention. Try it if you like. It didn't sound a comfortable plan, Alice thought, and for a few minutes on in silence, puzzling over the idea, and every now and then stopped to help the poor knight was not a good rider. Whenever the horse stopped, which it did very often, off in front, and whenever it went on again, which it generally did rather suddenly, he fell off. Otherwise, he kept on pretty well, except that he had a habit of now and then falling. And as he generally did this on the side on which Alice was walking, she soon found this plan not to walk quite close to the horse. I'm afraid you've not practiced in riding, she ventured to say, as she was helping him up from his fifth tumble looked very much surprised and a little offended at the remark. What makes you say that? he asked back into the saddle, keeping hold of Alice's hair with one hand to save himself on the other side. Because people don't fall off quite so often when they've had much practice. I've had plenty of practice, the knight said very gravely. Plenty of practice. I think of nothing better to say than indeed, but she said it as heartily as she could. In a little way in the silence after this, the knight with his eyes shut, muttering to himself, and Alice looked for the next tumble. The great art of writing, 
the no uh, night down in a loud voice, waving his right arm as he spoke. Is to keep, he ended as suddenly as it had begun, as the night fell heavily on the top of his head, exactly where Alice was walking. She was quite frightened this time, and said, and an anxiously picked him up again, I hope no bones are broken. None to speak of, the knight said, as if he didn't mind breaking two or three of them. The great art of writing, as I was saying, is balance properly, like this, you know. He let go the bridle and stretched out both Alice what he meant, and this time he fell flat on his back right under the horse. Plenty of practice, he went on repeating, all the time that Alice was getting paid again. Plenty of practice. It's too ridiculous, cried Alice, lose this time. You ought to have a wooden horse on wheels that you ought. Does that smoothly? The knight asked in a tone of great interest, clasping his horse as he spoke just in time to save himself from tumbling off again. Smoothly than a live horse, Alice said with a little scream of laughter in spite of all she could do to prevent it. I'll get one, the knight said thoughtfully to himself. Several. There was a short silence after this, and then the I'm a great hand at inventing things. Now I dare say you noticed the laugh that I was looking rather thoughtful. You were a little grave, said Alice. And just I, uh, just then I was inventing a new way of getting over a gate. Would you like to hear it very much indeed? Alice said politely. I'll tell you how I came tonight. You see, I said to myself, the only difficulty is with the feet. The head is high. Now, first I put my head on top of the gate, then the head's high, then I stand on my head, then the feet are high enough, you see, then I'm over, you see? I suppose you'd be over when that was done, Alice said hotly. But don't you're hard? I haven't tried it yet, the knight said gravely, so I can't tell for certain, but it'd be a little hard. He looked so vexed at the idea that Alice looked hastily. What a curious helmet you've got, she said cheerfully. Is that your invention? The knight looked quite proudly at his helmet, which hung from the saddle. said, But I've invented a better one than that, like a sugar loaf. Wear it. If I fell off the horse, it always touched the ground directly, so I had a very long sea. But there was the danger of falling into it, to be sure. That happened to the worst of it was before I could get out again, the other white knight came to put it on. He thought on it. The knight looked so solemn about it that Alice did not dare to laugh. I'm afraid you must have hurt him, she said in a trembling voice, being on the top of his head. I had to kick him, of course, the knight said very seriously. And then he took the head, but it took hours and hours to get me out. I was as fast as, as light, you know. But that's a different kind of fastness, Alice objected. Ted, it was all kinds of fastness with me, I can assure you, he said. He was in some excitement as he said this and instantly rolled out of the saddle and fell headlong ditch. Alice ran to the side of the ditch to look for him. She was by the fall, as for some time he had kept on very well, and he was afraid that he really was hurt this time. However, though she could see nothing but feet, she was much relieved to hear that he was talking on in his usual tone. Kinds of fastness, he replied, but it was careless of him to put another man's helmet on the man in it, too. How can you go on talking so quietly, head word? Alice asked as she dragged him out by the feet and laid him in a heap on the bank. Knight looked surprised at the question. What does it matter where my body happens to be? My mind goes on working all the same. In fact, the more head downward I am, the more I do things. Now, the cleverest thing of the sort that I ever did, he was, was inventing a new pudding during the meat course. In time to have the next course, said Alice. Well, that was quick work, certainly. Last course, the knight said in a slow, thoughtful tone. No, certainly not the next course. Then it would have to be the next day. I suppose you wouldn't do pudding courses in one dinner. Well, not the next day, the knight repeated, or not the next day. In fact, he went on holding his head down and his voice lower. 
I don't believe that pudding was ever, that whatever well, was cooked. I don't believe that pudding ever will be cooked. And yet it was a very clever pudding to invent. What did you mean it to be made of? Alice asked, hoping to cheer him up, for the poor knight seemed spirited about it. It began with blotting paper, the knight round. That wouldn't be very nice, I'm afraid. Not very nice alone, quite eagerly, but you've no idea what a difference it makes mixing it with other things, such as sealing wax, and here I must leave you. They had just come to the end of the wood. Alice puzzled. She was thinking about the pudding. You are sad, the knight said his tone. Let me sing you a song to comfort you. Is it very long? Alice asked a good deal of poetry that day. It's long, said the knight, but it's very, everyone that hears me sing it either brings the tears into their eyes. What? said Alice, for the knight had made a sudden pause. Or else, the name of the song is called Haddock's Eyes. Oh, that's the name of the song, said, trying to feel interested. No, you don't understand, the knight, looking a little vexed. That's what the name is called. The name really is the aged one. And I ought, then I ought to have said, that's what the song is called, corrected herself. No, you oughtn't. That's quite another thing. The song is what it means. That's what only, uh, that's only what it's called, you know. Well, what is the song then, said Alice, who was by this time completely bewildered. That, the knight said, the song really is a sitting on a goon's my own invention. So saying, he stopped his horse and let the rein be its neck, then slowly beating time with one hand and with a faint smile, gentle, foolish face, as if he enjoyed the music of his song, he began. Strange things Alice saw in her journey through the looking glass. This was the one that she remembered most clearly. Years afterwards, she would bring the whole scene back again, as if only yesterday. The mild blue eyes and kindly smile of the night gleaming through the hair, the shining on his armor, and a blaze of light that quite dazzled her, first quietly moving about, with the reins hanging loose on his neck, cropping the grass and the black shadows of forest beyond. All this she took in like a picture as, shading her eyes, she leaned against a tree, watching the strange pair, and listening to the melancholy music of the song. But the tune isn't his own, she said to herself. It's I give thee all, I give no more, or I can give no more. She stood and listened very attentively, but no tears came into her eyes. Everything I can, there's little to relate. I saw an aged, aged man sitting on a gate. Aged man, I said, and who is it you live, and how is it you live? And then through my head, like water through a sieve, he said, I look for butterflies and the wheat. I make them into mutton pies and tell, sell them on the street. I he said, who sail on stormy seas, and that's the way I get my bread a trifle. But I was thinking of a plan to dye one's whiskers green, and always use so that they could not be seen. So having no reply to give, what the old man cried, come tell me how you live, and thumped him on the head. His accent smile took up, he said, I go my ways. And then I find a mountain mill. I set it, and thence they make a stuff they call Roland's mess per, uh, our oil. Yet two pence half a penny is all they give me for my toil. But I was thinking of a way to free oneself on batter. So go on from day to day, getting a little fatter. I shook him well from side to his face was blue. Come tell me how you live, I cried, and what it is you do. I hunt for haddock's eyes among the hither, heather bright, and work them in buttons in the silent night. And these I do not sell for gold or coin, silvery shine, but for a copper halfpenny, and that will purchase nine. Sometimes dig for buttered rolls or set limed twigs for crabs. I sometimes eat knolls for wheels on handsome cabs. And that's the way he gave a wink, I will wealth, and very gladly I will drink your honor's noble health. I hear him, for I had just completed my design, to keep the menarum rust, my boiling it in wine. I thanked him the way he got his wealth, 
but chiefly for his wish that he might drink my and now, if ere my chance I put my fingers into glue, or wheeze a right hand foot into a left hand shoe, or if I drop my upon my heavy weight, I weep for it reminds me so of what the men of the old know, whose look was mild, whose speech was slow, whose hair was whiter than the snow, this was very like a crow, with eyes like cinders all aglow, who seemed to straggle, who rocked the body to and fro, and muttered mumblingly and low, as it was full of dough. He snorted like a buffalo that summer evening long ago, a city. As the knight sang the last words of the ballad, he gathered up the reins and head along the road by which he had come. He only got a few, he said, down the hill and over that little brook, and then you'll be a queen. But you'll stay in rest. He added as Alice turned with an eager look in the direction in which he. I shan't be long. You'll wait and wave a handkerchief when I get to that turn in the road. Encourage me, you see. Of course I'll wait, said Alice, and thank you very much for coming so far. I liked it very much. I hope so, the knight said doubtfully, but just so much as I thought you would. So they shook hands, and then the knight rode slowly a west. It won't take long to see him off, I expect, Alice said to herself and him. There he goes, right on his head as usual. Whenever he gets easily, uh, however, he gets on again pretty easily. That comes of having so many thoughts. So she went on talking to herself as she watched the horse slowly along the road, and the knight tumbling off, first on one side and then on the other. The fourth or fifth tumble, he reached the turn, and then she waved her handkerchief to him and he waited till he was out of sight. I hope it encouraged him, she said as she turned to run. Now for the last brook, and to be queen! How grand it sounds! A few, few small steps brought her to the edge of the brook. The eighth square at last she bounded across, and threw herself down to the rest, and down to rest on a little moss, with little flower beds dotted about in here and there. How oh, glad I am to be here! And what is this on my head? She exclaimed in a tone of dis her hands up to something very heavy that fitted tight all round her head. Can it have got here without my knowing it? She said to herself as she lifted it off and set it to make out what it could possibly be. It was a golden crown. Chapter 9 well, Ram said Alice, I never expected I should be a queen so soon, and I'll tell you what it is, she went on in a severe tone. She was always rather fond of scolding herself. It's do for you to be lolling about on the ground, grass like this. Queens have to be no. So she got up and walked about rather stiffly at first, as she was afraid them off, but she comforted herself with the thought that there was nobody to see it. I really am a queen, she said as she sat down again. I shall be able to manage it quite well. I'll... Everything was happening so oddly that she didn't feel a bit surprised finding the red queen and the white queen sitting close to her, on one on each side. She would have liked very much to ask them how they came here, but she feared it would not sibyl. However, there would be no harm, she thought, in asking if the game was over. Please, would you tell me, she began, looking timidly at the Red Queen. Speak when you are seen, interrupted sharply. But if everybody obeyed that rule, said Alice, ready for a little argument. And if you only speak when you are spoken to, and the other person for you to begin, you see nobody would ever say anything. So that ridiculous, cried the Queen. You see, child. Here she broke off with a frown, and, after thinking for a moment, subject to the conversation. What do you mean by, if you really are a queen? But my yourself so, you can't be a queen, you know, till you've passed the proper examination. If you begin it, the better. I only said if, poor Alice pleaded in a piteous The two queens looked at each other, and the red queen remarked with a little shudder. She says that if. But she said a great deal more than that, the White Queen moaned, wringing her hands. Oh, ever so much more than that. So you did, you know, Queen said to Alice. Always speak the truth before you speak and write it words. I'm sure I didn't mean Alice was beginning, but the Red Queen 
and interrupted her impatience. That's just what I complain of. You should have meant. What do you suppose is the use of any meaning? Even a joke should have some meaning, and a child's more important than a joke. You wouldn't deny that, even if you tried with a, with both hands. With my hands, Alice objected. Nobody said you did, said the Red Queen. If you tried. She's in that state of mind, said the White Queen, that she wants something, only she doesn't know what to deny. A nasty, vicious temper, the Red And then there was an uncomfortable silence for a moment or two. The Reds, by saying to the White Queen, I invite you to Alice's dinner party. This, The White Queen smiled feebly and said, And I invite you. I didn't know at all, said Alice. But if there is to be one, I think I ought to invite the guests. You have the opportunity of doing it, the Red Queen remarked. But I dare say you've not had many lessons. Yet. Manners are not taught in lessons, said Alice. Lessons teach and things of that sort. Can you do addition? The White Queen asked. That's one and 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 one. I don't know. Count. She can't do addition. The Red Queen interrupted. Can you do subtraction? Ten eight. Nine from eight. I can't. You know. Alice replied very readily. Do subtraction, said the White Queen. Can you do division? Divide a loaf by a knife. Answer to that. I suppose. Alice was beginning, but the Red Queen answered for her course. Try another subtraction sum. Take a bone from a dog. What does what remains? The bone wouldn't remain, of course, if I took it, and the dog wouldn't remain. It would bite me, and I'm sure I shouldn't remain. Then you think nothing would remain? said the Queen. I think that's the answer. Wrong as usual, said the Red Queen. The dog's... But I don't see how... Why, look here, the Red Queen replied. The dog's temper, wouldn't it? Perhaps it would, Alice replied cautiously. Then way its temper would remain, the queen exclaimed triumphantly, said as gravely as she could. They might go different ways, but she couldn't help thinking to her dreadful nonsense, we are talking. She can't do sums a bit, the, queen, the queens said together with great emphasis. Can you do sums, Alice said. Turned the white queen, for she did not, she didn't like being found fault with so much. She gasped and shut her eyes. I can do addition, she said. If you give me time, I do subtraction under any circumstances. Of course, you know your ABC, and uh, to be sure I do, said Alice. So do I, the white queen whispered. Work together, dear, and I'll tell you a secret. I can read words of one letter. Isn't that grand? However, don't be discouraged. You'll come to it in time. Queen began again. Can you answer useful questions? She said. Hide. I know that, Alice cried eagerly. You take some flower. Where do you pick her? The white queen asked. In a garden or in the hedges? Well, it isn't pink, Alice exclaimed. It's ground. How many acres of ground? You mustn't leave out so many things. Fan her head. The Red Queen anxious. She'll be feverish after so much thinking. So they set to work and fanned her with this till she had to beg them to leave off. It blew her hair about so. Again now, said the Red Queen. Do you know languages? What's the French for fiddle dee dee? Not French, or not English, Alice answered bravely. Whoever said the Red Queen? Alice thought she saw a way of out of the difficulty this time. If you'll tell me what language fiddle dee dee is, I'll tell you the French for it, she exclaimed. But the Red Queen drew herself up rather steadily and said, Queens never make... I wish queens never asked questions, Alice thought to herself. Don't let us... said the White Queen in an anxious tone. What is the cause of lightning? Lightning, Alice said very decidedly, for she, qu she felt quite certain about this. Is the... Th no! She hastily corrected herself. I meant the other way. It's too late to correct it when you've once said a thing that fixes it, and you must take the consequences. It reminds me, the White Queen said, looking down and nervously clasping and unclasping her. We had such a thunderstorm last Tuesday. I mean, one of the last set, as you know. Alice was puzzling. In our country, she remarked, there's only one. 
The Red Queen said that's a poor, thin way of doing things. Now here we mostly have two or three at a time, and sometimes in winter we take as many as five nights together. No. Are five nights warmer than one night, then? Alice ventured to ask. Five times? But they should be five times as cold by the same rule. Just, the Red Queen, five times as warm and five times as cold, just as I've five as you are, and five times as clever. Alice sighed and gave it up, exactly like a riddle with no answer, she thought. Humpty Dumpty saw it too, went on in a low voice, more as if she were talking to herself. He came to the door with his hand. What did he want? said the Red Queen. He said he would, the White Queen went on, because he was looking for a hippopotamus. Now, as it happened, there wasn't such a thing in the house that morning. Is there generally? Alice asked in an astonished tone. Well, only on Tuesday, said the Queen. I know, said Alice. He wanted to punish the fish, but because here the White Queen, be it was such a thunderstorm you can't think. She never could, you know, said the Red. Part of the roof came off, and ever so much thunder got in, and it was rolling around the rumps and knocking over the tables and things, till I was so frightened I couldn't remember my own name. Alice thought to herself, I never should try to remember my name in the middle of an accident. Be Where would be the use of it? And she did not say it out loud, for fear of Queen's feelings. Your Majesty must excuse her, the Red Queen said to Alice, Queen's hands in her own, and gently stroking it. She means well, but she can't foolish things as a general rule. The White Queen looked timidly at Alice, who ought to say something kind, but really couldn't think of anything at the moment. She never was up, the Red Queen done, went on, but it's amazing how good-tempered she is, and see how pleased she'll be. But this was more than Alice had courage to do. Yes, and putting her hair in papers would do wonders with her. The White Queen sighed and laid her head on Alice's lap. I am so sleepy. She She's tired, poor thing, said the Red Queen. Smooth her hair, lend her cap, and sing her a soothing lullaby. I haven't got a nightcap with me, said Alice. She tried to obey the first direction, and I don't know any soothing lullabies. Myself said, then, said the Red Queen, and she began, hush a -bye, lady, and till the feast's ready, we've time for a nap. When the feast's over, we'll go Red Queen, White Queen, and Alice, and all. And now you know the words, she put her head down on Alice's other shoulder. Just sing it to me, uh, it through to me, sleepy too. In another moment, both queens were fast asleep and snoring aloud. What am I to do? exclaimed Alice, looking about in great perplexity, as first her head and then the other rolled down from her shoulder and lay like a heavy lump in her lap. I ever it ever happened before that anyone had to take care of two queens since No, not in all the history of England. It couldn't you know, because they're never one queen at a time. Do wake up, you heavy things, she went on in an impatient tone. There was no answer but a gentle snoring. The snoring got more distinct every minute, more like a tune. At last, one could even make out words, and she listened so eagerly the two great heads suddenly vanished from her lap, she suddenly missed them. She bore an arched doorway, over which were the words Queen Alice, in large and on either side of the arch. There was a bell handle. One was marked Visitor's Bell, Servant's Bell. I'll wait till the song's over, thought Alice, and then I'll ring the... Which bell must I ring? She went on, very much puzzled by the t by the I'm not a visitor, but I'm not a servant. There ought to be one marked queen, you know. The door opened a little way, and a creature with a long beak put its head out for a moment, and said mittens till the week after next, and shut the door again with a bang. Alice knocked in for a long time, but at last uh, a very old frog, who was sitting on got up and hobbled slowly toward her. He was dressed in bright yellow and head on. What is it now? The frog said in a deep, hoarse whisper. Alice turned round, ready to find fault with anybody. Where's the servant who's been to the door? She began angrily. Which door? said the frog. Alice, all irritation at the slow drawl in which he spoke. This door, of course! The frog looked at its large, dull eyes for a minute, 
Then he went nearer and rubbed it as if he were trying whether the paint would come off or not. Then he looked to answer the door, he said. What's it been asking for? He was so scarcely hear him. I don't know what you mean, she said. It speaks English, doesn't it? English, doesn't I? The frog went on. Or are you deaf? What did I ask you? Nala said impatiently. I've been knocking at it. Shouldn't do that. Shouldn't do that. Wexes it, you know. Then he went up and gave the door a kick beat. You let it alone. He patted out. Uh, panted out its tree, and it'll let you alone, you know. At this moment, the door was flung open. A voice was heard singing, To the looking glass world, it was Alice that scepter in my hand and a crown on my head. Let the looking glass creatures, whatever, come and dine with the Red Queen, the White Queen, and me. And hundreds of voices joined in the chorus. Fill up the glasses as quick as you can and sprinkle the table with buttons and bran, and the coffee and mice in the tea, and welcome Queen Alice with three, thirty tea. Then followed a confused noise of cheering, and Alice thought to herself, thirty is ninety. I wonder if anybody's coming. In a minute there was silence again, and this little voice sang another verse. Oh, looking gra glass creatures, quoth Alice, draw in honor to see me, a favor to hear. "'Tis a privilege high to have dinner and tea, "'red between the white queen and me. "'Then came the chorus again, "'to fill up the glasses with tr "'or something else that is pleasant to drink. "'Mix sand with the cider and wool, and "'welcome Queen Alice with ninety times nine. Ninety times nine, Alice repeated in despair. "'Oh, that'll never be done. "'I'd better go on in, in at once.' "'And in she went, and there was a dead silence "'the moment she appeared.' glanced nervously along the table as she walked up to the large hall and noticed the fifty guests, all of all kinds. Some were animals, some birds, and there were even among them. I'm glad you've come without waiting to be asked, she thought. I never, I never, I should never have known who were the right people to invite. And there were three chairs at the head of the table. The red and white queens had already taken two of them. One was empty. Alice sat down in it, rather uncomfortable at the silence, and longing. At last the Red Queen began. You've missed the soup and fish, she said. Put on the joint. And the waiter set a leg of mutton before Alice, who looked at it rather. She had never had to carve a joint before. You look a little shy. Let me introduce you to that leg, said the Red Queen. Alice, mutton, mutton, Alice. The leg of mutton got up station, made a little bow to Alice, and Alice returned the bow, but knowing whether, not knowing whether to be used. May I give you a slice, she said, taking up the knife and fork and cutting a queen to the other. Certainly not, the Red Queen said very decidedly. It is an etiquette you have been introduced to. Remove the joint, said the waiter, uh, and the waiters carried large plum pudding in its place. I won't be introduced to the pudding, please, very hastily, or we shall get no dinner at all. May I give you some? But the Red Queen growled. Pudding, Alice, Alice, pudding, remove the pudding. And the waiter plead that Alice couldn't return its bow. However, she didn't see why the Red Queen shunned to give orders. So, as an experiment, she called out, waiters, bring back the pudding. And there, in a moment, like a conjuring trick, it was so large that she couldn't help feeling a little shy. As she had been with the mutton, however, she conquered her shyness by a great effort, sliced, and handed it to the Red Queen. What impertinence, said the pudding. I wonder how you are to cut a slice of you, you creature. It spoke in a thick voice, and Alice hadn't a word to say in reply. She could only sit and look at it. Make a remark, said the Red Queen. It's ridiculous to leave all the conversation to the pudding, you know. I've had such a quantity of poetry repeated to me today, Alice began, at finding that the moment she opened her lips, there was dead silence, and all looked upon her. And it's a very curious thing, I think. Every poem was about fishes, and do you know why they're so fond of fishes all about here? She spoke to the red quiz a little, uh, who, whose answer was a little wide of the mark. She said very slowly and solemnly, putting her mouth close to Alice's ear. He knows a lovely riddle, all in poetry, all about fishes. Shall she repeat it? Just he's very kind to mention it.
the White Queen murmured into Alice's other ear in a voice like pigeon. It would be such a treat, may I? Please do, very politely. The White Queen laughed with delight, and stroking Alice's cheek, she began. First the fish must be caught. That is easy. A baby, I think, could. Next the fish must be bought. That is easy. A penny, I think, would have bought it. The fish. That is easy, and will not take more than a minute. Let sh that is easy, because it is already in it. Bring it here, let me sup. It is easy, fish on the table. Take the dish cover up. Ah, that is so hard, unable, for it holds it like glue, holds the lid to the dish, while it lies in the middle, which is easiest to do. Undish cover the fish, or dish cover the riddle. Need to think about it, and then guess, said the Red Queen. Meanwhile, we'll drink your health. Queen of She screamed at the top of her voice, and all the guests began drinking it directly, and very queerly managed it. Some of them put their glasses upon their heads like extinguishers and drank all faces. Others upset the decanters and drank the wine as it ran off the edges of the table. Three of them, who looked like kangaroos, scrambled into the dish of roast mutton and began eagerly to eat. Just like pigs in a trough, thought Alice. You ought to return thanks in a niche, said the Red Queen frowning at Alice as she spoke. We must support, the White Queen whispered as Alice got up to do it, very obediently, but a little frightened. Thank you very much, she whispered in reply, but I can do quite well without. Be at all the thing, the Red Queen said very decidedly, so Alice threw it with a good grace. And they did push so, she said afterward when she was telling her of the feast. You would have thought they wanted to squeeze me flat. In fact, it was rather hard to keep in her place while she made her speech. The two push and the queens pushed her so aside that they nearly lifted her up into the air. I rise to return thing again, and she really did rise as she spoke several inches. She got hold of the edge of the table and pulled herself down again. Take care of yourself, screamed the white queen there with both hands. Something's going to happen. And then, as Alice as Alice awkward dis afterward described it, all sorts of things happened in a moment. They grew up to the ceiling, looking something like a bed of rushes with fireworks at the top. Well, they took, they each took a pair of plates, which they hastily fitted on its wings with forks for legs, went fluttering about in all directions, and very like birds they thought to herself, as well as she could in the dreadful confusion that was beginning. At this moment, she laughed her at her side and turned to see what was the matter with the white queen but instead there was a leg of mutton sitting in a chair here i am cried a voice from the soup to Alice turned again just in time to see the queen's broad good-natured face grinning up at her from the tureen before she disappeared into the soup there was not a moment already several of the guests were trying down uh, lying down in the dishes and the soup ladle was table toward alice's chair and beckoning to her impatiently to get out of the way I can't be longer, she cried as she jumped up and seized the tablecloth with both hands. One good dish as guests and candles came crashing down together in a heap on the floor. And as for Yon turning fiercely upon the Red Queen, whom she considered the cause of all the but the Queen was no longer at her side, and she was sudden she had suddenly dwindled down a little doll, and was now on the table merrily running around and around after her own was trailing behind her. At any rate, uh, at any other time, Alice was surprised at this, but she was far too much excited to be surprised at anything now. As she repeated, catching hold of the little creature, in a very act of jumping over a bottle which had John uh, alighted upon the table, I'll shake you into a kitten, and that I will. Chapter 10 She shook, uh, she took her off the table, and shook her backwards and forwards with all her might. The Red Queen made no resistance, only her face grew very small and her eyes got large and green, and still Alice went on shaking her. She kept on growing shorter and fatter and softer and rounder and chubbin, waking, and it really was a kitten after all. Well, which dreamed it? Your Red Majesty shouldn't purr so loud, in her eyes and addressing the kitten respectfully, yet with some severity. You would 
oh, such a nice dream. And you've been along with me, Kit, through the looking glass world. Do you know it, dear? It was a very inconvenient habit of kittens that made the remark that whatever you say to them, they always purr. If they would guess and meow for no, or any rule of that sort, she had said, so that one conversation. But how can you talk with a person if they always say the same thing? On this occasion, the kitten only purred, and it was impossible to guess whether it meant yes or no. Hunted among the chessmen on the table until she had found the red. Queen. Then she went down on her knees on the hearth rug and put the kitten and the queen to look at each other. She cried, clapping her hands triumphantly. Confess that was what you turned in, but it wouldn't look at it, she said when she was explaining the thing afterward to her sister. It turned intended not to see it, but it looked a little ashamed of itself, so I think it queen. Sit up a little more stiffly, dear. Alice cried with a merry curtsy while you're thinking what to what to purr. It saves time, remember? And gave it one little kiss, just in honor of it having been a red queen. Snowdrop, my pet, she went on, looking over her shoulder at the white kitten, which was still patiently with it. When will Dinah have finished with your white majesty, I wonder? That must be so untidy in my dream. Dinah, do you know that you're scrubbing a white queen? Rip disrespectful of you. And what did Dinah turn into, I wonder? She prattled on as she settled down with one elbow on the rug and her chin in her hand to watch the kittens. Dinah, did you turn into Humpty Dumpty? I think you did. However, you'd better not mention it to your fur. I'm not sure. By the way, Kitty, if only you'd been really with me, there was one thing you would have enjoyed. I had such a quantity of poetry said to me all this. Tomorrow morning you shall have a real treat. All the time you're eating your breakfast, I'll repeat Carpenter to you, and then you can make believe it's oysters here. Now, Kitty, let it was that dreamed it all. This is a serious question, my dear, and you should not paw like that, as if Dinah hadn't washed you this morning. You see, Kitty, it must be me or the Red King. He was part of the dream, of course. But then I was a part of him. Was it the Red King, Kitty? You were his wife, my dear, so you ought to know. Okay, settle it. I'm sure your pa can wait. But the provoking kitten only beat the other pa and pretended it hadn't heard the question. Which do you think it was? A boat beneath a sunny sky lingering onward dreamily in an evening. Children three that nestled near, eager eye and willing ear, pleased to hear. Long has paled that sunny sky, echoes fade and memories die, frosts have slain July. Still she haunts me phantom-wise, Alice dies, never seen by waking eyes. Children yet a tale to hear, eager ear, loving shall nestle near. In a wonderland they lie, dreaming as the day, dreaming as the summers die. Ever drifting down the stream, lingering in the dream, life, what is it all but a dream? the end so next week we'll start another book i'm not sure which i'm going to do i'm kind of leaning it's in the popper by uh, mark twain uh who knows it might be some but we will figure that out next week thanks for stopping